Hey, welcome to Mark's Motivational Podcast on this uh, Wednesday evening, the eve of New Year's Eve. I'm delighted tonight to be joined by another author, Greg Fields. Um, we're going to talk about the two novels that, he, that he's, um, he's published. His late ones, late, latest one is called Through the Waters and the, the Wild, his second novel. So I'll be very interested to um, speak to uh, Greg tonight. Um, so we'll be talking in a moment. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Mark's Motivational Podcast. So um, you're very welcome along tonight, Greg. Um, to, so you're very welcome again, again to Mark's Motivational Podcast. Um, tonight I'm delighted to be joined by another author, Greg Fields, um, who's done two novels. Um, the first one's called Through the Waters and, and the, the, the Wild, Through the Waters and the Wild. Um, it's available on, on Amazon at the moment. Well, it will be on the 15th of, of uh, this month. So you're very welcome along, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here, Mark. It's uh, it's great to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. So um, I think we'll start off with um, uh, how many many novels have you done? I've done two. This is my second, and um, somewhat different than the first. The first novel, uh, Arc of the Comet, was published in October of 2017, and it was a fairly ambitious undertaking. My publisher has told me this is the longest novel they've ever published. It came in at 648 pages. Yeah. Um, and, and he said he would publish the second novel provided I was a little bit more reasonable in terms of the length. So yeah. Through the Waters in the Wild is set for a January 15th release. And that is um, 90,000 words, about 300 pages, uh, a typical novel length. But the stories are somewhat intertwined. Um, the themes in the books, I think, are very closely related, and they're very important to me personally. And um, the writing of, of both of them really allowed me to delve into my own Irish heritage and come to a better understanding in myself of, of what that means for who I am today. Um, so it's been, I think writing any novel is somewhat cathartic. Um, for any any author and for any purpose, but in my particular case, uh, it was the, the first novel was um, a very ambitious and fairly wrenching experience. The second novel was more reflective, and I think the difference shows in the reading of those two books. Yeah, and uh, the first one, like, um, how long did it take you to do your first novel, uh, Greg? Oh. Oh, because it, it seems took, like, it seems a long book. <laughs> yeah, it took a long book. Um, yeah. It took a it took a while. It took about seven years. Okay. And honestly, Mark, if it, it would not have gotten into print, um, I would have given it up if it weren't for a very accidental meeting with Pat Conroy, the the American novelist. Okay. Um, we, um, my wife, got. I was a huge fan of Pat Conroy and his writing. Um, Prince of Tides remains probably the most influential book in my life. Oh, I heard that's a great uh, he, book, yeah. No, it's a fabulous book. And um, the, the movie actually did it justice. I was, I was pleased with the, the movie adaptation. But he wrote so many other things. And my wife got me tickets to one of his addresses. Okay. And included in that ticket was um, a VIP reception afterwards. Well, I didn't know anybody at the VIP reception. There were maybe 50 people there. And so to make sure that the evening was not a total loss, I went over to the hors d'oeuvre table. And while I'm loading up my plate with shrimp, I feel this hand on my shoulder. And I turn around and it's Pat Conroy who says, we've not met, I'm Pat Conroy. We ended up talking for probably half an hour one-on-one -on -one, while everybody else circled around and wondered, who's this guy? Mm -hmm. um, but we found immediately that we shared the same literary influences. We shared the same birthday. We shared some of the same life experiences. Um, at one point he asked me, I told him I was writing the first novel. At one point he asked if I could quote any of it. Uh, since I had only had one glass of wine, I was able to. <laughs> and yeah. he, he got very serious and said, I'd like to read it. Send me what you've got and I'll, I'll be happy to offer a jacket quote for it. Um, we did communicate. He showed me something in that novel that I didn't have the courage to see for myself. And he passed before its publication. But 
uh, to this day, he remains a very singular influence. And I know that first novel would not have come to life were it not for the validation that, that his words gave me. Because that's great, because he's actually motivated you to keep going with the book. Like, how far were you along with that book when you, when you met? Uh... Uh, well, I had, um, I had a first draft. Okay. And I wasn't happy with it. Um, okay. And the first draft was just a sprawling hundreds of pages mess. Hmm. And so at that point, I was ready to throw up my hands and just say, you know, why bother? It's going to take a sculptor to get this thing in any type of order. Yeah. But Pat related to it in terms of its language and in terms of what he saw as the passion behind it. And to me, that was, that was a telling thing. Um, I started to read a little bit after that about the impact of passion on the work that we do. Mm -hmm. um, and it became very important to me. And I, I, I resolved that if I could not do that, my professional life, my personal life, if I couldn't do any element of my existence without a suitable degree of passion, then that sometimes, but um, I, I think there's no, there's no substitute for passion in mm -hmm completing a task and addressing a task with every bit of energy and, and intellect that you can bring to it. Well, congratulations. And um, has, has that book done, done well? Um, has, has your book done well, Greg? Ark and the Comet did reasonably well. Um, it, it was nominated for three national awards. Brilliant. It did not win any. Uh, uh, yeah. But the, the proudest nomination was for the 2018 Kindle Book of the Year in Literary Fiction. And uh, again, it, did, it didn't win any, but it, it, it made me think of, of every Academy Award nominated actor or actress who said it's a thrill just to be nominated. And yeah, they're right. It's, it's, it's a thrill just to be nominated. Uh, it's a validation that I think every author seeks and, and we're all neurotic. So that validation is critically important. Yeah, congratulations, Greg, that's brilliant, that's brilliant. So you might just tell the listeners um, maybe um, a short part of the first book, if you wouldn't mind, Greg, that'd be brilliant. Sure, uh, the first book. Little, yeah, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, Arc of the Comet traces um, the development over a course of about 15 years of two main characters, one who's uh, very gifted, very, very charismatic, uh, intelligent, athletic, uh, popular, and the other is very insecure and, and very humble and on the surface very average. And what that book does is follow the arcs of these two characters over about 15 years and deals with, on the part of one character, the more gifted character, the idea of hubris. You know, a man expecting the world to come to him on his terms is bound to lose that world. Mm. And, and that actually happens in the book. Um, the secondary character, uh, by pretty much staying the course, remaining true to his own sense of self, um, degree, at the end finds a degree of satisfaction and completion. Um, the first book asks very directly the questions that I think every individual has to address at some point. Where shall I go now? What shall I do? And at the end of the first book, the secondary character, um, the more subdued character, realizes that those questions have no answers, that all the answers are only temporary. And what matters is the asking of those questions. And he has come to believe that when we stop asking ourselves those questions, then we stop, to, we stop living. Um, so in the end, he becomes a very wise, uh, enlightened, uh, very uh, a character with a high level of integrity, while the principal character, who we followed for probably two thirds of the book, um, is disillusioned and broken and depressed, uh, and he has some he has some work to do, and that's where the book ends. Not to give not to give away an ending, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that, that sounds really good, like, um, because, like, that can kind of be, um, like, what this podcast is, like, motivational thing as well mm -hmm. for, um, for, for, for people listening, like, the, that book sounds really good, like, where if, if, you, if you stop asking yourself them questions, like, you know, um, 
it's very important to keep asking yourself them kind of questions. Do you, do you agree, Greg? Oh, absolutely. I think I think when individuals get to a point where they think they've got the answers, when they think that they've arrived at every place they want to be, I think that's a very dangerous stage for them mm. because all of our lives are a process of evolution mm -hmm. and change is the normality. So what do you do as an individual when you're confronted with that change, either personal or professional, sometimes spiritual? Um, how do you react to it? The idea to me is, is to keep those questions alive, to be continually mm. questioning and evaluating where you are, what you're doing and why you're doing it so that you can approach the elements of your life with a degree of, of passion, which leads to a greater sense of control. Yeah, that's really good, Greg. Yeah, that's brilliantly said. Because um, what, I, what I try to get, get across in my podcast as well is exactly that. Like um, people kind of go towards goals all the time, but they forget about the process. You know, like I think it's important to kind of concentrate in the process of getting there, enjoy the process. Because once you get to, a, get to get to a goal, it can kind of be a, kind of an anticlimax. You know, so it's important mm -hmm. to kind of keep the process going. Would you, would, would would that be kind of the the line of, of your book there as well. Absolutely. Um, that the journey is what matters. I mean, we're never going to reach a, a, a finish line. Um, but what matters is, is running the race yeah. and running it in a way where your eyes are open, your senses are alive, and, and your mind is uh, able to embrace whatever it encounters in the context of your own integrity. So, uh, you know, that it sound, in, in, in one sense, it sounds simple. I think it's extraordinarily hard. And I think we need constant reminders mm. of, of how to do it. It's important. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's wonderful sound. Yeah, you know, that, that sounds really good. I must try and get my hands on that book as well. Um, just what's, what's the name of the for, first book again, Greg? First book is called Arc of the Comet. Okay. Um, yeah, because yeah. I, I, I can put them on the, your, your book's names on the show notes as well for people to, to, that's available on Amazon as well, is it? Yes, yeah, Amazon, yeah. Barnes & Noble, all the usual online outlets. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And um, your second book um, we, we might talk about next, um, the, the, the True um, Waters and, and the, the Wild. Yes. Um, the second book actually, the second book is a generational tale uh, of exile and redemption. Um, and it is generational because what I, I did in the second book was pick up the story of the dispirited character at the end of the first book, Connor Finnegan, um, about 20 years later. And he's still dispirited. He's still struggling to put the pieces of his life together. He feels exiled from himself. But to do that, he hearkens to the story of his grandfather, Liam Finnegan, um, a farmer, Dungarvan, County Waterford, um, got caught up in the Irish Civil War in the 20s and in a fairly bold strike, left Ireland and came to the United States never to go, never to go back. And through recalling the conversations he had had with his grandfather and through his grandfather's letters, um, Connor turns to the older man uh, for wisdom. It also gave me an opportunity to tell Liam's story and how he was able to resolve his own discontent, which mirrors Connor's very, very closely in the beginning. But the difference being at that point that Liam was able to find a reserve of, of, of courage. He was not going to sacrifice who he was as an individual, the things he believed in and the ethics that he saw for himself. He was not gonna sacrifice that to the conditions of the times. And he found a degree of courage to bring himself out of that with no guarantees uh, at considerable risk. But the alternative of staying behind and stagnating, and as he put it, condemning his children and grandchildren to the same type of life that he was living was, was unacceptable to him and he had to break away. So Connor draws from that story. And in the end, um, renews himself. And again, without giving away too much of it, yeah. But those lessons are, you know, Liam Finnegan is a simple man. He's a simple farmer, um, mm -hmm. not terribly well educated, but with a very high sense of integrity. And 
the fact that he's able to author for himself a life that becomes very satisfying in after after he makes this transition um, and very much a product of self-determination to me shows that anyone can do it yeah yeah no, no the, the two books sound amazing like um i say a lot of listeners because I, I was reading there like um the the kind of the um detail about your book you've, you've got a lot of um uh, um good good media of the book is is that correct to say that people have got gave a lot of good reviews so far on your oh, book yeah. like your second novel yeah, I've I've been overwhelmed by the response to the second novel, yes. um, it, it, and 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 I'm overwhelmed in a couple of ways. One is, you know, I'm just so grateful that people are reading the book um, preliminarily and offering their reviews. But it also tells me, you know, there are so many good writers out there. There are so many people who have talent and vision and skill, and you know the the line between recognition and, and obscurity is, you know, when, when I was on the other side of that line, when I, before I had published, I thought the line was, it was, was a mile wide and that it would take a tremendous amount of luck and good fortune to be able to cross it. Yeah. Um, it did, but it also took a lot of perseverance. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, I, I, one of the things I'm doing now, I'm, I'm, I'm an editor for my publisher, and that gives me a chance to work with, with writers who have submitted their books for consideration. And the, the talent um, that is out there is just, just incredible. I think what it needs is a bit of motivation and a bit of confidence, a bit of belief in yourself. Yeah. That's a hard thing to come by when you're a neurotic writer who hasn't published yet. Um, and so, part of what I try to do, uh, you know, honoring the tremendous gift that Pat Conroy gave me, I try to instill that confidence in, in these writers that have talent, but have not yet had the experience of bringing that talent to the public. Uh, oh, that's pretty sick. That's, that's immensely sick. gratifying. Yeah, because perseverance is a very motivational word as well. I think, uh, Greg, like, you know, that you, you mentioned perseverance there, like, it's, it, it, it's a great way to keep keep it going and motivated like be, to be persevere with stuff you know yeah i i who, who was it who said um and, and it, it's escaping me famous author said you know paper your walls with rejection slips mm -hmm. um <laughs> it sounds good it makes for really colorful walls but it, it's 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 hard it's hard to be rejected it um is, yeah. but you know it's also part of the process nobody nobody goes through life without some level of rejection and i think you have to learn how to how to deal with that while still retaining your sense of self exactly like the a good way of thinking about it, i think greg as well is kind of there's no such thing as failure it's it's um kind of if you if you have been set back if you can if you, you've been rejected in some way don't look at a rejection look at how can i improve how can i get better you know um like, like you know you can kind of can put you off like being rejected but you can kind of think to yourself yeah. it, you can go forward and improve the next time like you know that, that that's kind of it's a good way rejection can kind of be a, a good way to motivate you to get better you know i think yeah yeah and and, and I, there there are lessons in every rejection it's mm. it takes a special level of of confidence a special level of self to be able to look at that rejection any rejection and see what that lesson might be. Um, it can also be fairly motivating. I mean, yeah. I, I found early on that um, with, with my first novel, uh, you know, I had a chip on my shoulder. Uh, after, after, after a certain level of rejection, a couple publishers rejected it. And I thought, wait, Pat Conroy thinks this is a good work. Um, so you guys aren't getting it and I'm going to go find somebody who does. And so that actually worked in a, in a fairly motivational way for me Yeah. that, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to prove people wrong. Yeah, that, that, that worked for you. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's, that's really good. Cause, um, obviously it's a, it's a good book and you kind of had that back in a pot behind you. So that kind of, um, kept you going. Would that be right? Yeah. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's it's a it was a good book, but it was just long. My publisher, it was funny. I I, I sent it to him on a whim. I did have an offer from from a, one of the larger publishers, but I wasn't happy with it. Mm-hmm. And I sent it to Kohler Press. They live, they're about three hours away from me. Uh, I knew nothing about them, but I submitted the book online on a Thursday. The publisher, John Kohler, called me up himself on Monday and said it was a beautiful weekend here. The sun was out and the birds were singing and I spent all weekend reading your book and we're not going to publish it. Um, and I, I, I actually was thrilled. Here was a publisher who thought enough to call me up personally and, and yeah. tell me why he would not publish my book. Um, and he said, it just, it's, it's too long. It's just too long. Um, and, and, and at that point, I didn't really care. I, I, I thought, you know, this is a fairly remarkable approach to things. No other publisher had done that. Three days later, he called me back and said he talked to his senior editor and they'll find a way to publish it. Um, and I just, I've been in love with, with Kohler books ever since. And their, their very personal uh, approach, not just to publishing, but to the people who, who, who write, the, write the words. Um, that's special. And so again, I've, I've, I've learned from that. Yeah, that's what like yeah they 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 kind of a human side like because you probably get a lot of in a lot of organisations irrespective of its um if it's uh, publishers or anything like that if if you have a human being kind of a human side of it as well that's going to make you uh, people are more they're kind and um you know show a bit of compassion and, and help you're definitely going to yeah. go with them you know I think yeah I I think part of the what made perhaps one of the most difficult things about rejection is the impression. um you send something in and you get a letter, of, which is obviously a form letter. Um, and, you know, that, it, it, you can always infer that they didn't take it seriously enough. Nobody spent time with what it is I was asking for. They just very quickly and mechanically rejected it. And that might be the hardest part of it. Um, you know, in my sense, again, that was that was fairly motivational because, you know, I wanted to, to show everybody they were wrong, but yeah. um, so. And then um, just, um, you know, what, how long did it take you to do your second book, uh, Greg? How long did it take you to? Well, the second book was only about three years. Three years, <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. During, during, sorry to go across you. During, during that three years, like, um, like, would you have a kind of a, a, a strategy um, to, to, to write so many words a week or anything like that? What, what way did you approach it yourself just for, for people who are, are starting to write books? Who are interested yeah, in I, 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 no, I, I, I had no strategy. Um, the, the first book was just like opening a vein and bleeding onto the page. It was, it was kind of an explosion. And I wrote when I was motivated to do so. And only at the end of the manuscript did I start to outline what came next. The second book was much more planned. Uh, I outlined the chapters. I had a notion of what I wanted to do with it. Um, and I followed the outlines as best I could, including character outlines. Um, but I did not, I, I've heard so many people say, uh, you've got to write every day. And, and I don't discount that. I think in some ways it's true. Um, and I would tell people, I, I don't write every day, but I think every day about the book and about the characters and about where I want to take it. Um, that's just me. And I think every writer has their own style. Um, yeah. So there, there's no really right way or wrong way. I, I, I wrote in spurts. You know, I would write maybe for four or five days straight as the idea came together and I felt I had to get it out. But then I would take it, you know, maybe four or five more days to think about the next step in the outline and what I wanted to do with it and make sure that I was approaching it in a way that made sense. Yeah, but, that, that, but that sounds like a great strategy in itself. Like, you know, Greg, that, that sounds really good. Because like you say, everybody's different, different approach. But um, would you, you know, when you were writing the second book, let's say, did you kind of, um, to keep it going, did you kind of, um, how would you say, did you reward yourself for fi- finishing a chapter or did you use any kind of, Things like that, Greg. I, when I when I when I finished a chapter, I would I would kind of agonize over what I had just written, and tell myself this is really bad. Um, 
and then possibly go back and rewrite it uh, and then agonize over the fact that this chapter is done and now I've got to do another one. And, you know, that, that's what I mean when all writers are neurotics. Um, you know, you, it, it's difficult sometimes to find the joy of accomplishment when you've still got a lot of the task ahead of you and you're not completely satisfied with what it is you've done to date. Um, yeah. I envy those writers who can close a chapter and, and clap their hands and say, okay, on to the next one. Um, but, but you must have a big celebration when you got it finished all the time when, you, when you're ready to, when you got it published. <laughs> I'd say that the oh, first my, oh my God, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, had, I had three launch parties for the first book, Brilliant. which obviously we can't do for the second book because of, of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. But the celebration, just being with people um, who've read the book or want to read the book, um, and just celebrating it, celebrate, and 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 to me, it wasn't just celebrating the book; it was celebrating really a sense of community. That you can build community around anything. You can build community around a sports team, or mm. or or a theater, um, or any type of work of art. This was a small community around this book, and I celebrated it because I felt we all belonged together. We all had maybe a similar thought that we could learn from one another and it was just glorious to be together so the parties were the parties are great oh yeah brilliant <laughs> yeah i'll have to do that myself when i when i get the paperback done <laughs> oh, and, do it i yeah and and i will tell you mark i i i i'm planning to come over to ireland um probably in the middle of the year when things lighten up a little bit and and have a party over there um yeah. uh it's just it's an excuse to celebrate just the sense of community. Because um, like that, it's a it's a brilliant um, uh, writers group that that Harry um, uh, has set up. Like, how long have you been part of that? Um, it's Inkies, I, isn't it? It's called Inkies, isn't it? Oh, you know, the Ink Slingers. Yeah. Ink Slingers. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah. We call it the Inkies. Yeah, I, I'm 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 one of the token Americans, um, and I joined. I think it was in July. Um, and it's just been, you know, it's it's been terrific. The the one thing that that really has amazed me in in both of these books is the collegiality of other writers. Mm -hmm. um, we may all be neurotics, but we're not competitive. No. And you know that's that's been really encouraging. And I've made friends um, with writers that I've reached out to. Um, you know, the wonderful experience was reaching out for endorsement quotes for the first novel. And I, I reached amazing in that, that sense of uh, collegiality among writers. Um, you know, we all are, I believe we all are neurotic, but we're not competitive and we're not territorial. Mm -hmm. um, for the first book, I, I reached out to some of my real literary heroes for endorsement quotes. Um, it, just kind of expecting to be ignored. Every one of them wrote back. And most of them said, no, I don't have the time to, to go through this book or, or give a quote. Um, but that sense of collegiality was, was quite amazing. One, um, I, I reached out to Niall Williams, um, who I consider to be the Irish Pat Conroy. Uh, you know, he, he, he lives in County Kerry and writes these magnificent lyrical almost spiritual examinations of the human condition um, and his writing just soars. So I reached out to him and I asked him and he wrote back and said, no, um, that he felt insecure enough about his own writing that he did not feel qualified to, to comment on anyone else's. And I, I thought if he's insecure, I should be in a closet somewhere sucking my thumb. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. because it's just marvelous but we, we've remained in touch and and the idea of shared creativity you know he he offered some very good advice in the writing of the second one and not so much in the content but in the approach you know this is what you should be thinking this is this is what he thinks when he completes one book and goes to the next and so on and it was just so encouraging and so amazing that a writer of that caliber would reach out to a virtual unknown um, and 
and collaborate, just collaborate on the process and, and be as encouraging as he was. There's, there's a wonderful sense of community around the written word. Right, yeah, because now that's absolutely great advice, Greg, because um, like what I try to say to listeners as well, don't be afraid to ask for help, you know, like whatever you do, it would be at music or writing or whatever it is, like there's always people that are willing to help you, you know, like we would be honored to help anybody that's in the same field, would you agree with me? Yeah, I think you're right. Um, maybe instinctively, as, as, as human creatures, we have the instinct to share. Yeah. I, I think maybe as we grow older and we complicate ourselves, that gets compromised somewhat. But instinctively, I mean, we're there for one another. And yeah. Yeah. that's the way it should be. Because um, I had another author on, on the podcast and um, she, she told me, she gave me advice to join a writer's group. And I'm delighted I did because um, the prompts every week to hurry um Harry Gibbs are just brilliant, like to to get you writing and it's, and then to actually get to read them out are brilliant, like because I've I've heard your one the last before the breakup of Christmas. Your 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 prompt was really really good. Your Christmas prompt was really good, Greg. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, I, Harry's prompts sometimes just you know you look at them and you kind of scratch your head and say what am I going to do with this? But uh, you know that's the challenge and that's you know that's that's the benefit of it. It really does stretch you as a writer and. The, you're right. The feedback that, that we get from this group yeah. is just brilliant. Because yeah, um, yeah. Margot Gorman was the, was the I couldn't she I never just forgot her name for me. Margot Gorman. She's another mm -hmm. author. You can check her out. She's really good. Um, she, oh, yeah. yeah, she's she's really good. Good books as well. But um, now she gave me that advice to um, reach out to a writers group, and I've done that. And I, I agree with you 100, Greg. It's it's really helpful. Yeah, um, and they're out there. I've been intrigued to look for other writers groups. Yeah. Um, maybe that don't force me to get up so early in the morning, but, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's, it's something, you know, I think once it gets in your blood, you almost have to honor that. You have to do whatever you can do to, to bring it out. Like what, what, what kind of got you starting in writing Greg, um, way back, back when, have you always written books? Have you always been interested in that Greg? Um, I've always been, things. I've always loved the, 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 the beauty of the written word. Um, I dabbled uh, a little bit with short pieces when I was younger, mm. um, but you know, there's, there's, there's the need to go out and earn a living. Yeah. So, you know, I developed a professional life that didn't really have room for writing. And finally it, it, it got to the point where I felt I had to do it. And as I say, the first book was somewhat cathartic. It was just kind of an explosion uh, but once I started it, I couldn't get away from it because I thought the story was compelling enough. Um, but yeah, I, I, it, it's interesting. I got out of college and I spent the next two or three years reading all the, all the books that I should have read in college. Mm -hmm. um, all the great works of literature that, you know, when they were assigned, I would just skim um, so that I would be done with it and know enough to get by whatever paper or test I had to take. Um, and I think that's when I really came to appreciate the, the magnificence of, of great writing and great writing in, in all its styles and all its genres. Um, you know, the, 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 the terseness of Hemingway to the expansiveness of someone like Thomas Wolfe, um, yeah. you know, they're all good and they're all worth, they're all worth absorbing. Yeah, but because it's gas, you should say that, like, I, I would be in exactly the same as you, like, in school, I wouldn't have been reading anything, like, but it's only in the last couple of years that I've really got a, an interest in non-fiction books and all that kind of stuff, it's, uh, like, reading, you can learn so much from books, like, um, um, at a, a very lo low cost as well, like, you can, uh, it's just amazing, isn't it, like, um, I can't, can't, um, I can't, um, talk about enough how, how, how good books are, you know? Yeah, I, and it's just, right now, I'm, I'm living a fantasy. Um, I'm making a life around books. I, you know, I, um, you know, I, I've written a couple, but, but as an editor, I get to read manuscripts yeah, yeah. that are fresh and exciting, and and most of them are very, very good. Um, and and it, the other thing it compels me to do is to read manuscripts in genres that I otherwise wouldn't pick up on my own. Yeah. And that's, 
that's something I highly recommend. You know, step outside your comfort level and um, weed something. You know, I, I, I do now. And, you know, there are lessons in fantasy settings that apply to the very cold, hard, and sometimes callous existence of 2020. Um, mm, yeah. And I hope so, yeah, I, I, there's, value in it. there's value in every book that comes across your desk. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that, that's because I'd say that's really good. Good experience to be an editor. Like that, that's great, Greg. That's great, I'd say. But um, whereabouts are you, are you living yourself, Greg, again? I'm sorry? Whereabouts do you live? Where are you from? I um, I grew up in Southern California. And right now I'm living outside Washington, D.C. in in Virginia. Um, yeah, I'd say the weather's pretty good over there. Better than Ireland, I'd say. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I uh, I've actually looked at properties in Ireland to relocate. I looked at properties on the West Coast and and found a couple that that were pretty intriguing and I thought might work. Um, but my wife told me, if you do that, you're going there as a single man. <laughs> and, and, um, she likes to visit, but she doesn't want to, she doesn't want to move there. Um, but, you know, we'll always come back and, um, you know, it, it, it's, again, in writing the second book in particular, um, in my case, what it meant to be Irish and you know, how that translates into the way I look at the world um, mm -hmm. and, and what it meant. You know, I've, I've been to Ireland several times and I tell people that um, you cannot go to Ireland and, and not have a conversation every time you turn a corner. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just one of the most encouraging aspects of just what, what we need, I think, as, as a society now. We need that connectivity. We need that openness. And um, I find it when I'm there. Oh, no, yeah. um, I don't have to, I haven't been over to Washington. I've been over to um, to Florida on the holidays. I just love it, like um, the weather and all that's just, just amazing. So <laughs> I have to pay, pay a visit yeah, and we can out. go off, off again, like, you know. <laughs> when, yeah. when uh, look, look out for sharks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Washington is, is a, I, I, I don't go into the city unless I absolutely have to, uh, but I'm tucked into the hillside, kind of out about 30 miles away from Washington, and there are hills and there are rivers and there are deer and foxes running through. Um, you know, I, I think one of the, one of the, one of the things that I look, I'm looking to do now is, is to simplify and just get back to the, to the core of things. Yeah, no, it's been absolutely great talking to you, Greg, about your books and the best luck with your new book. You know, I might just ask you one or two questions I ask um, most of my guests that come on, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. So I'll start you off first with um, your favorite book yourself or your favorite author. I think you, you said earlier on it might be Pat, but <laughs> <laughs> do you have a favorite? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Pat Conroy, Conroy, Prince of Tides, mm. really changed my life and instilled the notion of redemption, um, the fact, the simple reality that any character, any individual, no matter how flawed or dispirited or disillusioned can reclaim himself. Mm -hmm. And that book, um, as, I, as I came to know Pat's story a little bit more deeply, that was a personal reflection on his part, um, lyrical, language that I've never encountered in any other piece of writing. Uh, just the bridge between prose and poetry uh, was shattered in a lot of what he wrote. But Prince of Tides was the most lyrical, passionate, compelling work um, that he created. And it is my favorite book of all time. Because I'd recommend people to look at the film for us because the book is, um, is always much better than, than the movie. Because um, your imagination is so good, would you agree with me? Yeah, yeah. And the, and the, the book, I mean, the film was very good, but it yeah. did not do justice to some of the just magical lyrical passages in the book. Yeah. Uh, the passages where the main character was at his introspective best and questioning the steps and actions and, 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 and commissions that got him to the point 
where he was. And Pat wrote about it in such a way that you know it 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 reached into you and, and ab absolutely gripped your heart and your mind. Um, I, I remember telling him once on his on my best day, I could not come close to what he did on his worst. <laughs> and 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 he laughed. He did not disagree, uh, but uh, uh, he's just a, just an incredible incredible writer. And the world lost one of its most compelling voices when he passed away. Was, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I'll have to check out the book. I know I did see the film a long time ago, but um, you know, when you watch so much movies like I do, you have to kind of think for a moment, you know. But yeah. um, but no, that's 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 a great answer. And then um, the next thing um. Um, so what else does Greg do? Do you, do you have any other talents that you do, uh, by the writing? I have no talents. Um, I, I, actually, I, I my professional career was in uh, international development and in particular children's issues. And I still do a bit of consulting for organizations on those topics. Um, I was able to work a bit of that perspective into the second book. Um, oh, very good. And uh, I do that, but and and my and my other passion is um, uh, the game of baseball. Uh, oh, right. very good. Which which is perhaps makes no sense, but um, you know I played it, um, I coached it, my son played it, and I just find I find it very calming. You know, it's a game with well drawn lines and very clear rules. And the object is to go home. So, I, you know, to me, that's that's a very comforting, uh, comfort, comforting um, escape when I when I have an evening to spare and, and it's in season. Right. Yeah. Because oh, we used to play the equivalent equivalent of that uh, rounders when we were kids. <laughs> it's not like baseball, but it's rounders. We used to have, have a game of. Yeah, it's pretty close. Yeah. 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 yeah no. Um, that's great. Yeah. And um, yeah, what kind of music do you like? Are you into? Um, do, do you have a favorite band or favorite musician, uh, Greg? Oh God, yeah. Um, I I I like folk music, roots music. Um, John McCutcheon, um, oh, brilliant, yeah. the American songwriter and singer. I love. Um, I, <laughs> God help me, I've 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 listened to just about everything the Wolf Tones have ever have ever written and and performed. Um, and I'm absolutely in love with Liam Clancy and the Clancy Brothers. Um, oh, class, really good, yeah, really good. Yeah, yeah, but it's, especially Liam Clancy, who had just this, not just this remarkable voice, but I, I think this grasp mm. of, of the human character and a lot of what his writing was, um, you know, it wasn't the boisterous, you know, let's, let's go beat up a British guy type of, of singing. It was... Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of it was introspective and very deep and, and carried a great sense of place. So I've really come to appreciate that. Yeah, like uh, sing, song writing is just great. Like I'll, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be uh, beside you there on that one big time. And uh, yeah. did, you, did you miss, do, do, you go to, do you go to any concerts or anything like that, Greg? Have you, have you missed out on any, any live performances this year yourself? That you, you oh, I, you know, I'm at a stage where, where my wife and I go to concerts for geriatric rock. Um, <laughs> yeah. We, we saw that before, obviously before the shutdown, we saw The Who, mm -hmm. um, we saw Earth, Wind and Fire, we okay. saw we saw Van Morrison. Oh, class, um, that was great. Uh, Morrison was, it, you, know, it, it, you know, you're sitting there and you're watching a legend and, yeah. you know, he went through the whole concert and he never talked to the audience once, which I, th <laughs> I guess is part of the legend. But um, uh, yeah, that type of, you know, we... We're, we're, we now go to concerts for people that we should have seen when we were younger. Yeah, I'm the same. I went to see Bob Dylan there um, last summer. Like, I, I just think he's great. Like, what, what great songs, aren't they, Greg? Oh my God, you what saw Dylan? Like, yeah, yeah. But um, like, I, I, it's gas. Like, I was, I was waiting for him to sing the songs the way he sings them on the albums, but. <laughs> it wasn't like that. It was all different. Like, uh, he, he can't play guitar now, but it was a really good concert <laughs> still. But you know. Yeah, that's your choice. You know, plus you're in the presence of greatness. Geez, he won the Nobel Prize. Yeah, um, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's fabulous. Yeah, he played in Kilkenny last year. It was it was an amazing gig. Oh yeah, yeah. outstanding. Yeah, outstanding. Yeah. 
Yeah, but um, hopefully, like next year, when uh, this or next year, yeah, tomorrow is New Year's Day, but next year to, yeah. to, to, to be uh, back open again, like hopefully we get some live music going again, you know? Yeah, uh, you know, and and I there there is a sense of optimism for next year. It's going to be gradual, I know, but um, I like the idea of you know getting the vaccination and then getting a button that says I got the jab, yeah, and and, and walking around and just just recreating what we've what we've had to put aside for the last year exactly yeah well put because and how is it affecting i hope everything your family are all okay um during these hard times family's okay i mean, yeah. uh, we lost my father-in-law oh, right after right after the disease started uh he died the day after his 92nd birthday oh god um and just the brilliant man um one of the most natural people i've ever known and I loved him like my own father, but you know it was a good run. And beyond that, we've been extraordinarily careful, and everybody's good. How about you? Everything okay over there? Yeah, yeah, good, good. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Just we're just um, we're locked down now, f- level five again, restrictions. Like, but um, like uh, hopefully they, that they can't do anything else. But 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 um but do that at the moment because the cases are going very high but my heart goes out to anybody that's that's listening who's lost anybody or who, who's who's um who's who's struggling financially and all that kind of stuff at the moment like um hang in there we'll hopefully have a better 21 i hope you probably second that greg absolutely absolutely um we get through this together but we will get through it and yeah. what you said earlier you know find find the people who can help you um they're out there and i think especially now there's an openness there's a willingness to share what we can exactly no well well said yeah brilliant and then um, so uh, what would you have a favorite movies what would your favorite movies be do you have any favorite films <laughs> um the casablanca okay. among a classic Great film, yeah. um i also again the going back to the baseball theme um field of dreams and maybe i'm just draw, drawn to generational types of, of dramas yeah. Uh, but Field of Dreams and um, yeah, let's uh, check that one out. Yeah, but th- those two those two stand out for me. Well, you know, it's it's funny. I mean, we're not watching movies as much as we're streaming Netflix series. Um, you know, it's 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 almost like the 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 pandemic has has changed our approach to entertainment as well. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we're. You know, there, there's there's a there's a need for escapism, but yeah, I, I I long for the day to to go back to a theater and see something on a big screen again. Oh, me too, me too. <laughs> Which it was 100. percent But uh, you know, that's that, that's that's absolutely brilliant, Greg. I really appreciate um you coming on tonight. And just one last thing, um, would you hope to kind of your book sound amazing? Would you hope to kind of um someday to make it into a film or something like that would you would you because by reading um listen to the kind of the films would kind of would, would, would that be it would you be interested in happening greg uh, i i would be interested if someone had the vision to translate it mm. to a screen uh the first book is just too long and thick and ponderous to to have much chance of that second book has a chance the, the yeah. second book is more visual it has more of a sense of place, and I think the story may be more compelling. But we'll see. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna look for that. Yeah. Um, but I'll know all the best with your second book. I really hope it does really well for you. And then, as I said, if you want to send me on the, the the names of your two books, and I can put them on the show notes as well for you. You know, for people to find them. I'll drop you a note. I'll yeah. drop you a note. Yeah, that'd be Terrific. brilliant. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But listen. Um. It, would you like to? Um. Maybe. I thought your story was amazing there on on the um the Inkies there before the breakup of Christmas. Would would you be able to maybe give a short um rendition of that? Um, or if you haven't got prepared, there's no problem. But I just thought. Like, I, I, thank you. Um, the, the the Christmas story I, again. I I, I wrote of. Uh, uh, a man who'd fallen on hard times, who'd never really enjoyed Christmas. Um, that he, Christmas to him was the, the the slaps and the arguments and the cold. And the greatest, the, the best gift he ever got was a carton of smokes from his dad. And his mom never got out of her bottle long enough to give him much of anything. And he ends up on the streets after a 
committing some petty crimes and, and one not so petty crime after, after running away from home at the age of 13. Um, and he's, he's, he's found by someone who, who lived three houses down from him. You know, he's sleeping on a grate, sleeping in a storefront on Christmas Eve. And the other who has not seen him in years recognizes him and essentially pulls him to his feet and demands that he comes with, come with him to his flat where he has a spare bedroom. And his message is it's Christmas Eve and every exile deserves a stable on Christmas Eve. And the poor soul says, you know, those in exile, I'm, I'm not the Christ child. And the other, his friend says, you're as close to it as any of us from what I can tell. And they walk off and the last line is, you know, they're, they're walking off into the snow and the cold um, to the sound of angels singing their hosannas in soft and gentle voices. And to me, the angels are inside all of us and we just have to let them out. Uh, we have to acknowledge them. Um, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter where we exercise those qualities of mercy and goodness and, and assistance. You know, we don't make judgments on the people that, that come to us for whatever help we can give. And especially during this season, that struck me as something that was, was worth considering. Yeah. No, yeah, that story you, you, you wrote was really, really good, Greg. Like, really, really good. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, thanks Thank very you. much for sharing with, with, the, with everybody listening tonight as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, listen, I'm going to let you go now, but maybe could you maybe give one tip of motivation to people? Um, be it in writing or or anything in, in life that, that you could give anybody if you if you had to pull on the billboard, what, what would you what would you say, Greg? Ties into the to uh, what a what a brilliant segue because it ties into that last thought. Mm. Trust what's inside you. What's inside you has value, it has integrity. You may not even recognize the talent and strength that's there, but it is there. And you've got to trust that. Trust your character, trust your instinct, and do not abandon that sense of self, no matter what the temptations or pressures might be. In the end, you, I believe you'll reach a success that may not manifest itself in, in wealth or privilege or fame, but it's a success I think very few people actually reach. You will be, uh, you'll be your own person. You will be the sole determinant of who and what you are. Where shall I go now? What shall I do? That's perfect, Greg. Well said. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks very much for coming on tonight, Greg, and all the best in your future endeavors as well. Mark, thank you so much. Uh, it's been great talking to you, and I will look forward to Continuing this conversation on Saturdays when uh, when we get together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Thank thanks for so being my guest, and I really appreciate it. And all the best, um, and a very very happy new year to you as well, to you and your family. To you too. Stay safe. Okay, Greg Fields, everybody, and thanks for tuning into the podcast tonight, Mark's motivational podcast. Thank you.